Hello Booktube. Welcome. This is the first book review video on this channel on Heather Reads. Uh, the visual theme for this video will be English Urban Waterways. I think you'll see it's fitting. I've started with this shot which was taken from a ride on the London Eye in October 2019 and yes I knew I was taking a gamble to book a ticket in October. London can be beautiful in October. You can have sunny, warm days. However, uh, the odds are in favor of the weather that you can see I actually got, which is little raindrops on the glass of the bubble that we were riding inside. Down below, you'll see the River Thames and of course uh, the Houses of Parliament at Westminster and the iconic clock tower of Big Ben. But of course, Big Ben in 2019 was completely shrouded in scaffolding because it was undergoing a major renovation and that is a perfect lead into uh, what I'm going to talk about today because the book I'm going to review sheds light on a period of history you might think you know uh, but I don't think you may be aware of just how it might have led to a dramatic uh, political and social renovation of England 300 years before we did see those social changes come about. And this is the book. It's by Christopher Hill, published in 1972 originally, so not a new book, uh, although this paperback edition was brought out in 2019 by Penguin Random House UK. The world turned upside down, radical ideas during the English Revolution. Uh, the book is 427 pages long, of which 324 are the text itself. How would I summarize the book? That's the first question that I'm always going to ask uh, with a work of nonfiction. Well, I'm going to let the author speak for himself. I'm, this is a quote from page five of The World Turned Upside Down. Quote, the object of this book is to obtain a deeper insight into English society than the evidence permits either before 1640, make a note of that date, it's quite significant, uh, or after 1660 when censorship ensured that really subversive ideas were not published. And that's another key phrase, subversive ideas. Just bear in mind, this is the 17th century, so the 1600s. Hill considers the Civil War and the Interregnum from the vantage point of the people who had the least power, small craftsmen, uh, feudal farmers, agricultural workers. And he focuses in particular on a growing population of itinerant men uh, who had been, for one reason or other, excluded from their communities, who either could not or would not uh, bind themselves under the authority of either the landed gentry or the church. And this is important because it was from this growing segment of the population, which needed employment, that uh, Cromwell was able to build his new model army. Christopher Hill is, is he's looking at this brief period because there was a lapse of censorship control over what could be preached or what could be published. And this was an unprecedented opportunity and both men and women from lower social classes became free to speak their minds and to publish their thoughts and to distribute those thoughts in writing. And those thoughts, you will see as we continue this review, were very, very much ahead of their time. If you are like me and your knowledge of the 17th century in England or anywhere is sketchy, it's going to surprise you to discover the number of people who in the 1600s were advocating free national medical care, such as it was, but nevertheless, a free universal education up to and including university, greater rights for women, the abandonment of Latin as a language of scholarship. And along with that, there were also religious questions, questioning the existence of God, questioning the authority of the Bible as a moral guide. These are ideas that, if you're like me, you associate with the later 19th and 20th centuries. It surprised me uh, for Hill to point out that common people several centuries earlier had already suggested and asked for these kinds of sweeping social changes. I have copied 
full citation details for the book at the bottom of the screen uh, in case you're interested in buying the same edition that I'm reviewing today. But before we deal with the book in more detail, I'd like to talk a little about the author Christopher Hill. Hill uh, was born in 1912 and uh, lived until 2003. He graduated from Oxford University and eventually became master of Balliol College, Oxford, between 1965 and 1978. He came from a devout Methodist family. I think that's interesting that a non-conformist strain uh, existed in his ancestry going back, I believe, several generations. And he became uh, a Marxist historian. He was good friends with uh, Eric Hobsbawm. You're probably more familiar if you do read history with Hobsbawm uh, because the latter made more public appearances and because of those public appearances, his books sold in larger numbers. Well, Christopher Hill was a more uh, private, quiet personality who didn't seek uh, the public eye so much. He specialized in the English 17th century uh, because the political revolutions which took place at that time actually they gave a representative voice to people who did not normally have a representative voice, the, the lower social classes in England. Hill called his own work, he said, a history from below because he was looking for ways to give common people a true historical voice, true representation. In his introduction to The World Turned Upside Down, Hill does recommend a work that, that balances his, if if I can put it that way, that is a work that, that does regard the period of the Civil War and the Interregnum from the point of view of those in uh, the aristocratic and professional classes. And that was his colleague David Underdown, and the book was titled Pride's Purge and was published in 1971. Now, unfortunately, uh, Pride's Purge has not undergone the same number of reprints as The World Turned Upside Down. Um, I did have a look online. The cheapest copies I could see started at uh, UK sterling uh, 75 to 80 pounds, but they very quickly got into the hundreds. So uh, I, it's, <laughs> I'll leave you to decide if you have the, the budget for that. Uh, it seems to me like the sort of book that you would, you would buy because you wanted to specialize like Hill in the same period of time in history. Okay, time for a change of scenery. This is Bath looking at the River Avon. It's an iconic view of the city. It often appears on postcards, not that people buy or send postcards anymore, but be that as it may. My third question in this review is why did I choose this book? At the time I was shopping and found the title, I was reading Ford Maddox Ford's 1915 novel, The Good Soldier. The narrator of that novel, is a character called John Dowell, who claims to be a Philadelphia Quaker descended from the Dowell family who came to America with William Penn. Now, my impression of Dowell was that he did not seem to be a devout Quaker. But that got me wondering, how much did I really understand about Quakerism? I wasn't brought up with a religion. I don't have any family or friends who are Quakers. Uh, but I did know that the Quakers were a religious group who had their origins in the 17th century around the time of the Civil War. So when I saw Christopher Hill's book, I thought it might give me the understanding I was looking for. And it did. Chapter 10 is uh, devoted to the story of the beginnings of the Quaker movement. What interested me was to learn that the Quakers were originally more radical, or that's as best as can be understood. Because with a lack of censorship, you can imagine that radical ideas would be published, but also counter ideas to that radicalism. So there's a term that Hill's book will use again and again, ranters. People are called ranters. And Hill says it's unclear whether that term actually belongs to an organized group with a definite body of beliefs or whether that was a pejorative an insult that you hurled at someone because you believed they they subscribed to one of a number of ideas that you felt was heretical or dangerous. Um, for example, uh, if you didn't believe in the authority of the clergy, if you didn't believe in the authority of the Bible, 
if you, and this seems to be a very popular ranter idea, but it's unclear whether it was necessarily a Quaker idea, was the concept of grace as a kind of immunity from sin, so that uh, it made almost any act permissible. You can understand why people might find that idea dangerous. What the Quaker leadership recognized, though, as the interregnum went on and became more like a monarchy itself, and of course, after the Restoration, they realized that their survival would depend on having some authority structure. So if they if they were uh, inclined to not regard clergy as authoritative or not regard the Bible as authoritative, they, they nevertheless developed themselves uh, because of social changes into a group with some rules of engagement, some uh, structure of authority in order to uh, to ensure their survival, which of course th they did. You, you don't hear about other radical groups, the Muggletonians, the Levellers, the Diggers, the Fifth Monarchists. All these groups existed in England uh, during that 20 year window of relative freedom, but they did not survive the restoration and I think the fact that the Quakers did shows that they, they took a pragmatic view and, and uh, made some alterations to their beliefs, uh, some accommodation, so that they seemed more uh, acceptable by the government in power. But I also must admit, I'm going to put the book cover back on screen again and enlarge it if I can. What did catch my eye was this astounding little cartoon which I'm going to enlarge. There we go. So you can see in the middle of the picture, you have a man whose hands are where his feet should be. His feet are where his hands should be. I'll leave you to describe where the head and shoulders are. Mm -hmm. You can see uh, a horse driving its own cart, a fish flying, a rat chasing a cat, a hare chasing a hound. This was a cartoon that would have been published by detractors of radical ideas, anti-ranters, if you will, um, who really felt that uh, some of these unusual ideas uh, about changing society would upset a, a natural order. That is, they would make society unworkable. Uh, and uh, there, there's a sense in which, I wouldn't say they're necessarily correct, but it, w it became clear that the, uh, that many of the ideas were driven by a strong current of individualism. There was this idea that because you no longer needed the clergy to intercede between uh, an individual and God, any person could consider themselves to be inspired by God and uh, to do whatever it is they wish to do. And of course what clearly <laughs> became realized uh, during this time was that uh, maybe that wasn't God working because in spite all these people claiming to have the Spirit of God they didn't agree with each other at all. So you know it's true it, there was some chaos in the period there was some instability and and that may be one of the reasons why uh, during the Restoration and, and of course even during the later years of Cromwell's rule there was some reaction against these sort of ideas. Okay so question Four. more mundane matters now. Um, how did I get the book and how much did it cost? Well, as it happens, it was my birthday when I bought this. So whereas I would normally try to get books secondhand or from a library, or I will borrow any book from anyone who's willing to lend it if I if, uh, find it interesting. Uh, but on this case, I purchased full price, which was uh, sterling 12.99. Uh, which would be US dollars 1497. I've seen secondhand versions for between three to five pounds or seven to nine dollars US and the Kindle versions uh, at ten pounds or thirteen dollars US. Okay question five. Have I encountered anything that was unexpected or particularly interesting? Yes this book is all about the unexpected. It was mind-opening to realize um, just how this brief period of unprecedented liberty, what kinds of ideas came out uh, that were coming from ordinary people. They weren't coming necessarily from more educated men, although more educated men were involved. Um, Christopher Hill uh, confirmed also with several quotations, he was proving that although these ideas were being published between 1640 and 1660, it wasn't that they hadn't existed before, it simply was that they, uh, it was dangerous 
to speak about them or to write them down before. So he proved that while Shakespeare was alive, many of these radical ideas that were coming forward during the Civil War, had they'd been percolating for some time. Now, of course, the unfortunate thing is that these ideas, all these, these great concepts, once the monarchy was restored in 1660, they were repressed. And many of the uh, radical leaders, uh, religious leaders particularly, became wanted men. So it was just for this short time when men and women could uh, profess uh, something like lack of belief in God or belief in the established church, lack of belief in heaven or hell or sin, uh, or ask for educational reforms, ask for education to be available to uh, all people. Um, they were They were suggesting political structure changes and, and th those ran the gamut everything from what you might consider to be the most individual libertarian as we understand libertarian you know a minimum of controls and and much greater freedom for the individual to act as they will to on the other end of the spectrum you had non-hierarchical agrarian communes where all property was held in common and as far as i can tell that may be the first time the word communist uh, appeared in print Hill's book also contains a number of eye-opening anecdotes. I'm only going to share one because it relates to the arrest of King Charles I. It is generally known that on the 3rd of June, 1647, the king was arrested by the new model army. Now, I had always assumed that it was Cromwell himself who was present for that arrest, or if not Cromwell, then his senior generals acting on direct orders from Cromwell. Neither of these is true. Uh, the Hill revealed that Cromwell knew in advance that Charles would need to be secured by the army, but uh, he did not issue any order on the 3rd of June for that arrest. The initiative for that action was taken by a lower ranking officer named Joyce, who headed up a troop of 500 horsemen. Um, and Hill uses this fact just to illustrate how tenuous Cromwell's authority was as supreme commander of the New Model Army. And that's because the New Model Army was unlike any military force that had existed before that, and unlike any military force that existed after that. As, as we understand armies, officers are appointed by their superiors but not so in the New Model Army. Uh, in the New Model Army, officers got their authority because they had been chosen by the men who served under them. Now that's critical because what it means is the action that Joyce took on the 3rd of June, 1647, was decided by his men. In other words, the troop voted as equals to go out and arrest the King of England. That surprised me. Also, I did not realize that by this point in history, printing presses could be mobile. And I, obviously, I don't mean mobile in the sense that one person could pick it up and, and carry it. From the illustrations I've seen online, it, I think it would still be advisable to have a sturdy cart and a heavy horse in harness uh, and probably some strong people, two or three, to just do the heavy lifting on and off that cart. But nevertheless, there was mobility. So it meant that uh, in the event that a press was threatened with being broken up, it could be moved. Uh, it could be set up in an unexpected location. And of course, documents could be printed in secret. Um, he also discusses just the, the much higher percentage area of England that was covered by forests. And of course, the, those areas were very difficult to govern and police. And it was in those forests that we, you found the greatest number of this itinerant moving population that, that formed uh, the basis for the New Model Army. So of course, um, the distribution of uh, published material was very easy to carry out without being stopped or detected. Okay, new question, new picture. This is uh, Manchester Ship Canal. I did not take this picture, so uh, if anybody does know the precise location, if they recognize the bridge or the this interesting shaped, uh, looks like 19th century industrial building behind it, you know, by all means, leave a comment. Right, question six. Is there anything readers should be prepared for when they open up Christopher Hill's book? Yeah. Uh, Hill presumes that his readers have a fairly detailed knowledge of the important dates and personalities and events 
uh, that are associated with the English Civil War and the Interregnum. Now, if you're like me, you learned about the Civil War in high school, uh, and you can imagine the depth of that curriculum. And I had to use Google, yes, to fill in a lot of gaps. But I would say don't worry about that. Don't worry about uh, having things that you simply don't understand. There is plenty to take away from in this book, and uh, you won't go short of insights if you aren't a history major. Um, also footnotes. People fall into two uh, schools of thought about footnotes. Some people prefer to have them at the end of a book, I do, and that is how Hill has chosen to, or not Hill, but his publishers have chosen to set out the footnotes in this edition. Uh, if you prefer the other way, that is, if you prefer the footnote to be on the same page as the citation, so that, you know, when you see the citation, you can just look down and immediately read the detail of the footnote, then I, I'm not familiar with earlier editions of Hill's book, but you might want to check those out and see if the footnotes have been uh, handled differently. Uh, also, Christopher Hill makes this suggestion on page 55. I, He doesn't he could have made it a book if he'd wanted to, because it was a, an interesting suggestion. But of course, he's not alive to do that now. But if anybody else had the qualifications, I wish they'd conduct a study into the contributions to British literary, economic, scientific culture um, from the point of the Restoration and see the originators of, of those changes of thinking. Where did they come from? Did they come from the southeast of England, what we think of as sort of the the administrative uh, heart, or did they come from more outlying areas, Wales, Scotland, uh, the northeast and northwest, uh, and the southwest? Uh, because what Hill says is, is he postulated that British culture was uh, advanced further by people living in areas away from the southeast, because in the southeast they retained greater aristocratic and uh, clerical control over ideas and behavior, even during that 20 year period. Um, and also in remote parts of the Union, there was just greater sympathy uh, for independent thinking, for um, wanting to lose the, the structures of authority that existed in church and in state. Um, so yeah, if anybody would like to look into that, now, ideas for follow-up reading. I have three that I'd like to mention, that the area, books that relate to the same topic or they're significant to this period of time. John Milton, I haven't read Paradise Lost. I feel guilty about that. Uh, this book didn't make that guilt uh, any less, uh, what, disturbing, I guess. So I will have to uh, try to find uh, a copy of Paradise Lost and begin to study it sometime. Certainly uh, Hill shows how ideologically Milton dealt with the changes that happened around him and th that did make me more interested in Milton as a person. I, I perhaps had a different idea of where his sympathies lay. Uh, secondly, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, a very interesting philosophical work but it would not have existed if it weren't for that period of, sort of lowered censorship. It simply wouldn't have been allowed. And of course, it uh, the ideas in there are what we think of as almost proto-humanism, you know, the beginnings of a materialistic view of the universe and trying to use that view to solve uh, social problems. And finally, uh, Keith Thomas's 1971 book, Religion and the Decline of Magic. Hill does mention it. Uh, by coincidence, I own a copy. I've had it for, I, I'd say, at least 10 years. I... I didn't read very much. I think I read about 100 pages, but that was enough to give me a sense of, of this same idea that Hill was trying to bring out in his book, that the English were never were terribly devout Christians. <laughs> they were always a bit subversive. They were always a bit um, heretical. Uh, so th it, it ties in quite nicely uh, and also has chapters on... Uh, alchemy and uh, astrology, which Hill deals with in, a, in one single chapter, but I'd, he doesn't go into it in the same detail that, that Thomas does. So if, if that's a particular area of interest, then I would consider that, that uh, good follow-up reading. Okay, summing up, what would I say as my final comments about this book? Well, I'm aware that people might listen to this review and think we're talking about 
20 years in English history. I mean, 20 years. It almost seems a bit niche. I could I can understand that people would ask, what is the relevance of studying that period of history more closely? Well, I, I do think that this period of time had a much broader impact on England and on the world subsequently, because after the uh, restoration of the monarchy, that is when England began to colonize um, and, of course, later industrialized. And you're talking about the so the England that did that was an England that had experienced two completely different modes of governing. It had it had, had sort of almost a chaotic, open, uncensored environment where people were free to begin suggesting ideas, free to begin uh, creating communities that operated on a completely different um, social basis than had ever existed before. Uh, so you had that for a time, and then suddenly, sort of toward the end of the interregnum and the restoration of Charles II, you had this incredible crackdown and return to trying to put the lid on all of that um, uncontrolled thinking and uh, and discussing and, and trying out of new ideas. So I was thinking that is the, that's the country that went out into the world to meet other groups of people and then to try and deal with those cultures and those ideas as they encounter them. And, and so um, perhaps some of the of those less admirable actions of colonialism were were kind of a replaying of the restoration, trying desperately to get into control of people, trying to keep the lower orders from having too much of a say in uh, in their lives and and in how they would live those lives now hill also considers you know why why some reforming ideas didn't they, they didn't make it through anyway uh, for example uh, lack of belief in god if you don't believe in god you you can't make yourself and <laughs> certainly after the restoration i'm sure there were a number of people who who may have said one thing in public but they must have felt privately exactly as they had felt when they had the freedom that is that they they did not believe in the existence of god why didn't that become more popular why didn't it become more widespread and hill speculates that maybe god could not fully disappear as a possibility because there was no concept of of another kind of universe only a created one so there was no fully formed understanding ready for you know what you would do once you didn't believe in God what would you believe in um, I'm gonna finish by quoting Hill here he says the backwardness of history and natural science made it impossible to break through to a theory of evolution in which God would become an unnecessary hypothesis and of course that understanding did come in time which I think should be encouraging to reformers because it may show that sometimes an idea can take hold, it can seem to have popular appeal, and yet the, the broader culture doesn't change. And that might simply be because there's something missing, there's some key to understanding which would, which would suddenly turn that thinking around. And that's the end of this review. Thank you very much for tuning in. There will be a work of fiction next time. I will try, as best I can, to balance fiction and non-fiction as I promised uh, in my newbie video. But of course, I'm aware that fiction, it tends to be weightier, doesn't it? Sheer number of pages may make uh, the balancing act interesting, but you can look forward to seeing uh, how I get on. Thanks very much for joining me and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.